Hello! Although VBA can be considered as an obsolete technology, VBA macros are still widely used across millions of organizations in the world. VBA Engine is a part of several applications. This includes but not limited to Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel, most popular CAD applications such as SolidWorks, Autodesk Inventor, etc. VBA macros are small applications and needs to be considered as such. It means macro stability, reliability, performance, maintainability relies on the proper programming practices applied. In this video, I will show a practical example of applying best practices to improve the macro code. This will provide benefits to both macro developers and users. Here I have some files which represent invoices, which are simple XML files. The files are named with a specific notation, so they have a date and also the invoice number in their name. Excel macro which I'm going to use allows to move or rename the files based on the values in the columns. In this particular example, I'm going to use Excel functions to extract the date of the invoice and place it in the corresponding folder tree. So my invoices are going to be grouped by year, month and day. I will start by copying a couple of passes from my file and placing it into Excel. I can simply hold the Shift button and then I have a special menu in my context in Windows Explorer which is called Copy as Pass. So let's click it. Now I will be using Substitute function in Excel to compose the output file pass. As the date separated by dashes and invoice number separated by underscore in my invoice file name, I simply need to create two substitutes of dash and underscore to the backslash. Now I can propagate that formula and run the macro. So as a result you can see that two of my invoices can be grouped in the corresponding folders in my file explorer. Let's repeat that process on the rest of the files. So I'm just going to hold the shift button, paste all of my passes, also propagate the formula, select the range and run the macro again. And you can see it doesn't work now. So let me try one more time. Still fails. I bet at least once you experienced that situation if you ever used VBA macros. This could be very frustrating because you don't know what's happening, you don't have any feedback from your macro. We now have to debug this macro step by step to understand the problem. So I would open the macro for editing, place a breakpoint and click run. Now I can use F8 button to step through the code. So let's see where it's going to fail. We can check the intermediate state of variables and we can see that it fails on this line. Of course, in most of the cases, the person who experiences the problem is not the one who actually developed that macro. And this person might not have any development skills, so won't be able to troubleshoot that macro. Furthermore, as there is no feedback from a macro, this person won't be even able to provide some information to the developer to troubleshoot it remotely. I could see quite often when the developers are trying to what is called hide the problem. So they're trying to use something like on error resume next, so if any error occurred in a macro, it won't be displayed to the user. But that should be used very carefully, and you should always process the error and still display something to the user or log it somewhere. In this particular case, the on error resume next is placed in the beginning of the macro, which effectively means that all the errors will be swallowed and not displayed to the user. Let's comment this line out and see what the error is. Now I can simply run it again. I can also place a breakpoint on the last line, click F5, and now you can see there is a certain error displayed, which explains why our macro fails. In this case, this error happens because first two files were already moved while I haven't updated my Excel document, and when I run macro second time, I have pre-selected all of the files, which obviously means that two files are missing and function failed. One of the possible solutions would be to move that on resume next line directly into the rename file function. So if it fails, it's going to skip that particular file and continue. But I would still consider that as a hiding of the problem. So let's say that failed happened by some other reason. So for example, there is no access to this file, or maybe user specified incorrect file name. So it is important to let user know that macro has not succeeded, otherwise he will be able to find out about that problem sometime later which could generate even more problems in the future. In this case, it would be much safer to let your macro fail. I would recommend to follow the fail fast approach. That means that you let your macro fail, immediately you see some conditions are not met. Let's run macro again, and we can see that error is displayed to the user now. 
it is still not ideal, because if the consumer of your macro is not a developer, most likely he or she won't be able to troubleshoot it themselves, and they'll need to contact you. But in this case, they at least have some sort of information they can provide to the developer, so he can troubleshoot. But you, as a developer, need to aim to create an application which not only can be used by the end user without your intervention, but also could be troubleshooted themselves. This macro works in a batch, potentially on thousands of files, so it could be useful if you display which file failed. Now I want to modify my code and isolate an error for the specific file and re-raise that error with the more information about the file being processed. I'm just going to use on error go to for handling the error. So I'm just going to create a label, which is going to be error underscore, which is going to be a handler of my error. So in this case, I know that something is happened and I need to report a different error to the user. I'm going to use error raise command and I can specify some additional information, such as error number, I'm just going to use generic VB error and also the description of an error. So I can tell that basically when I was trying to run that function, it failed. And I can specify which particular file failed and what the destination file. As a result, this would display a more descriptive error. Of course, I can go ahead and specify even more details if I want to. Now I will define the exit label, and this label just means that there is no error in my code and I need to skip the error handling procedure. So I'm just going to use go to if my code has not failed. I haven't changed my input conditions, so if I run macro again, I would expect that error to appear. So let's run our function. I hit a breakpoint, so you can quickly navigate through the code. And now you can see that we redirected into the error handler routine. And you can see that we now have more descriptive error displayed to our user. The dialog you can see on the screen is displayed by the runtime, and it is displayed as a result of what is called unhandled exception. You try to avoid unhandled exceptions in your code and always handle them and display the proper error message. Although Visual Basic displays the error message when unhandled exception is thrown, but this would result in the software crash in the most other application types. Instead of raising error here, we can create a message box and show the error to the user. But I do not prefer that approach mainly because I want to keep all of my user-related activities in one place. Furthermore, I might want to provide a different output method for my errors, for example, to log it into the text file or to the Windows event logs. I might have a lot of other functions which might throw an error, and having a message box in each of them would put a lot of constraints into my code. It will be also hard to maintain. Instead, I want to centralize the handling of an error in my entry function. There is no native support for try-catch routine in Visual Basic as it is in some other languages. But I like to emulate that in my Visual Basic as well, so it's quite clean to read and understand the code. So in this case, I'm just going to put several labels, try, catch, and finally. Try is really redundant, it just makes me to read the code a little bit easier. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to catch in case of an error and go to finally when there is no error. And within my catch block, I'm just going to display a message box. And in this case, I'm just going to display a description of the error through it. So this will make my code universal and it will display the error for any exceptions thrown in any place in my macro. If I run my macro again, you can see that now the custom message box is displayed instead of the unhandled exception. But the message box still displays a descriptive error to my user. Now let's quickly check another scenario, so in this case I use invalid input. So I'm just going to select a single column. So my macro fails, but the error is not very descriptive. Basically macro picked up the next column as my destination column and just used empty string as my destination, so it failed. So instead of showing that error, I would explicitly check how many columns are selected by the user. And if this is not equal to 2, I'm just going to display another custom message. I will use errRise function to throw a new exception with a custom message. And you can see it's automatically handled by my code and this error is displayed to the user. Let's now summarize the first principle of writing a good and reliable macro. Use fail fast approach to terminate the macro as soon as any of the condition of the macro is not satisfied. 
avoid hiding the problem and prefer displaying the exception to the user rather than hiding that from them. Try to output information about the error in the centralized place rather than each individual function. Sometimes it might be hard to track the changes you've done to the macro. This is especially a problem when you have some regression issue and you want to understand what has been changed in the macro caused that error. In some cases you may play some temporary line into the code to streamline debugging. So in this case, for example, rather than picking up the selection, I can just define the range using the cells. So it will be just easier for me to debug as I do not need to keep selecting the cells in the Excel. Unfortunately, in some cases you might just forgot to uncomment those lines and return the macro to its original state and submit this to the production or to your users. So it would be very useful to track the changes you just made and even more to be able to track the changes across different revisions of the macro. And this is exactly what control version systems or CVS are designed for. You might have heard of the technologies such as Git, Mercurial, SVN and for the hosting solutions such as GitHub, GitLab or Bitbucket. Those are the mechanisms allowing to put your code under the version control. Such systems are designed to version control the code in the plain text format. While VBA macros in most applications such as Microsoft Excel, Word or CAD applications such as Solars or Inventor do store their macros in a binary format. CVS systems are not effective to manage binary data because you will not be able to understand the differences between the files and their revisions. So for the VBA macros, I would strongly recommend to make a text-only copy of the source code of your macros. This is even more important because the binary format the macros are stored in could be corrupted, so you may even lose your macro. In this video, I'm going to use git to store my source code and the server is just a local folder on my machine which I could back up on something like a Google Drive. Of course, you can use other technology or other hosting solutions. I will be releasing the beginner-friendly tutorial of practical usage of Git. So please subscribe to the channel to receive notification when video is published. I have already set up Git repository and submitted the first version of my macro. So I just need to create a folder which is going to be my local Git client and pull the data from the server. So you can see the macro has been copied locally, so I can view the source code in a plain text in a notepad. I can also browse the git repository to see what is happening on my server. So you can see currently I only have one revision and I can see the file tree as well. To create a new version of the macro, it is as simple as copy the code from Excel and paste it into the file. Now I can simply commit the change. Git tools are quite smart, so they can easily identify what has been changed in the file and display it to you in the simple format. So I can quickly find what has been added or removed. So in this case I can pick up that I haven't actually removed my test line. So before pushing that to revision I would like to modify that code and update my commit. I need to open the macro in Excel and just revert that change. I will copy the code, replace it in my file and click commit again. I can quickly inspect the changes, add some message and click commit and push to push the changes into my server. Of course, as you would expect, with git I can always look the history of my macro and see the code at any given moment. So I will not be concerned for pushing new code because I always will be able to revert this change if needed. So, the second principle is use revision control for your source code. Let's continue. You might have already noticed when I'm running the macro from Excel, there are two functions shown for me in the selection box. This is because Excel would select all parameterless functions and show them as a potential entry points to your macro. This logic is pretty consistent across different VBA macro enabled applications. And running invalid entry point may produce unexpected results, such as errors. And in this case, it might be just counterproductive trying to catch these errors in the code. In this case, it is better to limit entry points and only let Excel to select the valid one. Fortunately, it is a very easy way to fix that problem. So let's go to macro editing and simply add an optional parameter with a default value. 
In this case, we will not compromise any existing code which is utilizing that function, but at the same time, we let Excel know that this function has a parameter, so it shouldn't be selected as an entry point. Now, if we run the macro, we can only see one entry point in the selection. Let's finalize this step and commit our changes to the repository. As a summary, only use parameterless functions in your entry points. When developing macros or any other applications, try to make your function less dependent on the local variables or on the other functions. So in this case, for example, I don't need to create a local variable for my range. I would rather make it as a parameter of the function and only pass it where it's needed. This would allow me to call these functions with a different input if I want to. For example, I can easily alter that code to process all the cells in my current workbook. Next suggestion is to keep your functions independent of an environment where possible. In this example, rename file function takes two parameters, self for source file and self for the output file. Functions then extract the value from the cells and using that to rename the file. Of course, a range is a valid object within the context of Excel macro, but that function doesn't need to be to tie to the Excel. You might want to reuse that function in some other VBA macro, for example in Microsoft Word macro or SolidWorks macro. And in this case you will need to change that function as those applications will not understand what range or style is. But better you remove the dependency from the cell and modify the parameter types to be a strings for source file and destination file. In this case you will be able to reuse the function as is in any other VBA enabled applications. Now I need to update my function to use the proper variables. And also I will need to call that function with the values of the cells rather than cells themselves. This snippet over here is responsible of creating the directory structures for the destination file if that does not exist. There is also a comment which explains that snippet. Although that is acceptable, but this could be called what is known a code smell, which indicates that something is wrong and could be made better. Instead of directly implementing that logic in the rename file function, I would separate it into the separate function called create directories. In this case, I would not need to have a comment anymore because it will be clear from the function name what that code is doing. Now I simply need to call that function with a valid parameter. Now I need to perform few more modifications to make this code compatible with the changes I did. Final suggestion is to make the names of your functions, parameters and variables as descriptive as possible. Like in this case, process range is not a very descriptive name, so we better give it a different name to this function. We now can validate that our macro is still working correctly after all our modification, and it does, so we can simply commit this change as a new revision of the macro. As a summary, try to keep your functions as independent as possible and do not rely on other function, environment or variables. And also use descriptive name for your functions, variables, modules, classes, etc. As a final step, I would recommend to write some documentation for your macro. Or you can simply create a header, which will show the author of the macro, the contact details and a short description. Now we can commit our last change into the git repository. Finally, using the power of git, we can compare our current revision of the macro with the first revision, to see all the changes we did. These guidelines are also published on the CodeStack website, so please follow the link in the description of this video. Thank you for your time.